Okay, you're on. Okay, uh, this is going to be the third session and the last session of this workshop. Uh, so I'm going to just briefly go through the video that we've, I'm hoping that you all seen, and then we're going to implement some of the method that we have described it here. Uh, here, in the first session, we covered the statistical model. In the third session, in the second session, we covered the machine learning models like isolation, forest, one the same, all those things. And today we're going to talk about deep learning based models, uh, which is going to be the last session of this workshop as well. So as we describe, we, we, it's going to be self-supervised and the autoencoder and generative models. Uh, so I'm going to just briefly go over it super fast. And if you have any question, you can just raise the question. So, so the first 10, I guess 15 minutes going to be like a QA and you can raise the question whenever you want. So as to describe, is only is is mainly about the self supervised uh, uh, self supervised uh, prediction because we don't have any label, so that's why we are using a part of the data part of the data to be able to predict. And even the autoencoder is kind of like a uh, self supervised as well because we are using the data itself as the label, so we can say that that's self supervised. Self supervised is like a new. Uh, it's not gonna, it's not like a new technique, but it's, I would say. Maybe that's the future of machine learning because we don't have enough label and the only, the only thing that you can do is using a part of the data or even the whole data to be able to do any kind of representation or, or prediction and even for us going to be finding any kind of odd layer in the data. So as you describe, autoregressive is if you use the Bayesian rule uh, like uh, the, the probability rules to be able to break break down all the dimension or if you're talking about any sequence of data you can break it down to different pieces and then you can say the probability of the whole things is a combination of probability of each of the dimension or, or each of the feature based on the previous one uh, so that's the way that people are kind of using to be able to come up with the probability of uh, one sample in your data which means kind of like a learning the distribution of the data based on all the features or based on the sequence. Uh, this technique can be used for any kind of sequential data as well. And this is like a, even the pixel CNN or pixel RNN or WaveNet are kind of like a new papers that uh, is, they're, they're all like recent paper. And they're all talking about how can we learn about the data? How can we learn probability of X without having any label? And that's how they're using it. No question here? Good. And we talk about autoencoder. We said there's a three different version of it that I describe it here. But one of them is just using autoencoder by itself, which means just is like a, uh, like a compression technique that you are trying to compress your data to one, small, like a, to one latent space. It's like a, you can see it as a, like a as zipping. You're trying to compress your data and then decompress it. And if you are, if you can decompress it in a way that you can, that you are not losing that much information, you're saying that maybe the model is working well. And from that moment, you can say all the data that can give me less loss in that model, all of them are normal. And that's the whole point of autoencoder. So here you can use a dense. CNN or RNN based on your data. In this workshop, uh, I will just use the dense one, but I'm just going to let you know that if your input is, let's say, image, you better use CNN. If you're talking about any sequential data, you better use RNN or LSTM because, because then you can easily map it to one fixed size representation and then you can kind of decompress it to the actual data. So based on the type of your data, you can use different encoder or decoder. And that's the whole point. So the whole idea is the same thing. It's like given your input, compress it, and then decompress it. Based on the type of the data, you can use dense, CNN, or RNN. The other thing that you said is uh, additional autoencoder and the adversarial autoencoder, they're kind of learning the distribution of the data. So they're kind of letting you to be able to generate a sample as well. So the, dis so the cost is the distance between the generated one and the original one. And we'll use that score to compute the anomaly here as well. 
we will pass a normal data, compress it, and then decompress it, compute the distance, and then we'll say, OK, that's our, our odd layer score. Uh, you reproduce the input, right? Uh, where did you put the threshold if there is an anomaly or not? So the, the threshold is almost similar to the other technique that we talk about. Like for even for GMM, we said for threshold for computing the likelihood, and then once you compute the likelihood, you need a threshold. Even for a solution for us, for uh, for uh, one stream, we need a threshold. The threshold can actually comes from you, or if you have any kind of assumption about the data, you can use that. Sometimes you're saying that, I know for a fact that, let's say, 10% of the data is outlayer. So that's kind of, they call it like a contamination ratio or something like that. So then you can say that, put the threshold in, 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 a, in a, so set the threshold based on the number of outlayer that you're actually selecting. So you can, you can just say that, okay, if I put it to be, let's say, 0.1, just 10 sample will be outlayer. If I put it 0.2, 20 will be like that. So you can actually play with the threshold and see which one is the best for you. So there is no, I would say, correct answer for it. But if you have a label data, then you can actually see what will change. You, the thing that you're actually changing by changing threshold, you're, you're playing with the precision and recall. So it means if you say the threshold is higher, the recall will be, like, like the recall will be higher. And the other way, the precision will be higher. So it, it means which one is more important for you. You want to be able to predict all those at layer with the cost of having lots of false positive. Or you want to, if you're saying even like a small number of things are at layer, all of them are actually correct. So it means which one is more, the one who you care about. And that's why, based on that, you can actually set the threshold. Same thing apply here as well. And for even for in the code, I will use maybe sometimes we'll use the average, or I will let you play with it to see what will be the effect of it. So, even as as I said, if you have image, you better use convolution on a network, which basically convolution will help you to extract feature based on some spatial uh, dependency in, in in your input. Uh, here in the workshop, as I said, I will just use the dense models. So you will see that for MNIST, you won't be able to get that good result because it's an image. But if you convert it to CNN model, convolutional neural network model, the result will be a lot, you will get a lot better result. For variational autoencoder is uh, kind of similar to autoencoder, but the idea is uh, instead of uh, mapping your input to a fixed size, uh, like an embedding space, you're, you're, you're trying to map it to one probability distribution. And the definition of that probability distribution is those parameters. Like for Gaussian, the only thing that, that you need is mu and sigma. So what is the mixture of, uh, what is the mix, mixture of uh, Gaussian model is a bunch of mu and sigma. So the thing that you're doing here is just, you're trying to map it to a bunch of mu and sigma. So then you will say that, okay, now I'll learn the distribution of the sample, instead of just mapping to one arbitrary uh, like embedding space. So it's just, then if you can do that, then you're saying that I learned a Gaussian distribution of the data, I was able to map it to some bunch of Gaussian, mixture of Gaussian distribution, and then I can even sample from it and do all those things as well. So basically, this is similar to autoencoder, and the only thing that we are doing when you are implementing them is you are kind of adding a constraint. We are saying that the mu should be close to, let's say, zero, because you want to make it to be close to normal. And the sigma should be, let's say, close to one, because we want to have a normal distribution. And then we are just sampling from them, and then we are trying to reconstruct it based on that distribution that we generated. So it's just exactly, for us, for, 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 the, for this workshop, going to be exactly autoencoder, with some constraint. And, and the constraint is that regularizer. So the first part is exactly like autoencoder. The second part is, you can say, a regularizer that you're adding is like a constraint for the uh, embedding layer. What is P and Q here? And uh, X, X, Y, Z. Is it so I'm, I'm, the, the thing I'm not, I don't want to go that deep, but X is actual input. Mm -hmm. Z is 
as you can see in the upper uh, lower okay. picture, is kind of the sample that you're getting from the distribution. You can say that's your embedding. So Z is embedding. And then for to generate the output, is you're saying that it's a conditional probability. Yes. You're trying to compute the X given Z. So that's the whole thing. Like, uh, so then you're just saying, so, okay, give me X given Z. What is the likelihood of that? And then here you're saying that given like a uh, X compute Z, and then you want to say how similar is that Z to the actual normal distribution using the KL divergence. So then the KL, KL divergence just computing the distance between the Z, the, the Z that you have generated with, say, with, say, with a normal distribution. You try to enforce those numbers to be close to a normal distribution. That's just, is, you can just see it as a, let's say, you know L1 regularizer, regularizer or L2 regularizer, that the only thing that's doing, trying to make all the way to be close to zero. Here you can just say that you have a bunch of number, which is mu and sigma, and the only thing that is doing is trying to enforce half of it to be close to zero, the other have to be close to one, something like that. If you want to make it to be simple. Uh, so in this case, P of Z is fixed. It's a normal distribution. Right? Uh, or in the basic yes, case. Yes, it's exactly normal distribution. And what is uh, P theta? Uh, what, what are theta and phi? These are the parameter of the model. So here, uh, here you're saying that all the weight, all the weight here are your theta. That I, I think there was just a picture of that. No, that's the next, next one. one. The next one, yes. So th this is kind of like a, all the theta that is all the parameter that you're using to generate the Z. So, so you, you want to learn you why. you want to learn that. And so this is for the second one, for the decoder one. So it's just a naming. You're just saying that. Yeah, but which one is theta? And which one is phi? You can say theta is the first one, and this, oh, the other one is the second one. Doesn't matter. It's just a naming. So you can call it whatever you want. But the whole idea is the thing that you want to do here is given an x. Uh, you want to you want to learn a mu and and sigma, which basically is just two set of number. You can just combine them and say that's just one thing that the autoencoder is doing, uh, one layer. But then we are adding a constraint on top of it. The constraint is we want to make, make sure the first half is close to this is zero, the other half is close to one, something like that. The KL divergence the KL divergence here will enforce it. We'll see in the code. To be honest, I was, I was trying to see for the workshop, I was trying to say that how should I uh, use all these models for animal detection without asking you to actually implement in them. And then I was like, maybe I should just use a bunch of a library uh, and then just ask you to use it like uh, SQLR. And then I was like, then you won't learn how it's working. Then I end up kind of having all these models in the notebook so you can actually see how, it's how, how it has been implemented in the simplest way possible. And then you can play with it and actually see how it's actually working and how it can actually make it better. Oh, if anyone really is curious, there is another ACE workshop series dedicated almost yes. entirely to this. <laughs> so the previous one, which you were an audience member and we spent a lot of time on this. I guess, uh, in the, yes, in the previous one, they were actually trying, there was a one session for implementing VAE. Yeah. Here, we just want to use it in 10 minutes and just use it. And the code is there as well. So. I just try to make it to be simple. So that's the whole thing. The adversarial one is similar to the other thing, but instead of just saying that the half should be close to 0 and 1, it kind of using a GAN uh, technique, which is adversarial one, which is trying to say, which is the only thing it's doing is like it's trying to, so that, that section is just autoencoder and with, with its own loss. The discriminator one, the loss is if it can tell the difference between normal distribution and the embedding version here, then you, it will add a lot of loss to the model. So it will force the model to make this embedding close to the normal distribution. So that's why if you, if you can have any kind of distribution, you can just use it and then kind of map your data to any kind of distribution that you like. Can you take a question? Gans. Okay, yes. For, for um, okay. So the online question, okay. The online question is: um, For a VAE, do you keep a matrix sigma? Oh, sorry. 
yeah, for a VAE, do you keep a matrix matrix sigma? You assume that the distribution comes from a spherical Gaussian. Uh, if I get it correctly, we are assuming that. It, uh, let me actually read the question as well. Uh, yes, uh, it's not that you're assuming, we are enforcing. So the whole thing is not, we are, there is not the assumption, is like in the a, AAE or in VAE, we are enforcing the model to make the embedding to be close to the thing that we want. So I, so I would say, we're kind of saying that, okay, AP, I was using the regular uh, autoencoder. I was just mapping it to one arbitrary embedding space, which actually you can map any point, any sample to any point in the space. It can be anywhere. But the thing is, you have compressed it, so it is a lower dimension, but in that lower dimension, it can have any value. So you can actually use it for compression, you can kind of uh, use it for, to see, if, even for animal detection, you can kind of use it as well, or you can just extract it and say that's my embedding, like your own word embedding, your, or your own image embedding. So you can embed anything you want. But sometimes you're saying that my point is not to make an embedding, my point is to be able to generate from it. So you're adding a bunch of constraint here, you're saying that the, the media layer should be similar to a Gaussian model. Once you train the model, you're completely ditching the encoder part from that moment because that is a mixture of bunch of, is super close to a bunch of, uh, let's say, GML. So you can kind of uh, pass bunch of number and generate a new image. So from that moment, you can actually generate new image just by having the decoder part. She said, can we use it for Monte Carlo uh, prediction? Just if like the first part is to estimate uh, the distribution as it is predicted, right, with the parameters, and then the later part is just the usually part is the The thing is, there, okay, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Maybe I can look for it, but the thing is, the thing that you're doing here is not you're learning the distribution. The, the cool thing here is, like, see, back then we had input data. We were trying to fit a Gaussian. Here, you're mapping the data to a Gaussian. So it means that's why we have a bunch of hidden layer here. So we are kind of enforcing the model to map the data to a point which is similar to the Gaussian. So it's like, it's just mapping, not so you're not actually learning the distribution, you are mapping the data to a bunch of Gaussian distribution. So then from that moment, you can actually generate a sample from it. So it's like just a regular user, some constraint, a human constraint on top of embedding that you want to make sure that we can actually sample from it, which has nothing to do with out there detection here, because that's for generation. If you want to have any, if you want to have like a, that's why they, they, they call them generative model because you can actually generate a sample from it. Uh, so that's why it's generative model. But we don't want to use that the generative part, but we just want to see if we add that constraint, what will be eff the effect on the whole reconstruction part? Will it make it better or worse? That's what we want to see here. So let's move fast. So you can have it in, a, in a, any way you want. The, the other thing is like if you enforce it to map it to something that you want, then you can actually use that one as well to compute the distance. So you don't have to just see what is the distance between the input and output. You can say what is the distance between the embedding, uh, between the embedding as well. So you can actually maybe use it for clustering, for other things. Remember at the very end I said you can use a, a hybrid that you can use the, you can kind of extract the embedding part, you say it can be anything like that, and then you can use any clustering technique or uh, one SVM or isolation for us. Because here, the dimension is lower and it's similar to the thing that you kind of enforce the model to map the data to it, it will be easier for your 
uh, model for your second model to be able to maybe be able to capture the layer. 